Section 5.1, we're looking at complex numbers today, um, and we're going to start with just a basic definition of what an imaginary unit is. So an imaginary unit is the unit i, and it is defined to be the square root of negative 1. Um, an alternate definition um, to think about is that you can think about it as i squared is equal to negative 1. Okay, so those are the same statement. They're just phrased in different ways. Um, we will use both of those statements um, throughout our lesson today and um, on Friday when we finish this up. Complex numbers and imaginary units are related as follows. So the, the set of all numbers that have the form a plus bi are called complex numbers. Um, a and b are real numbers. Okay, so just the numbers you've been working with since you were little, right? So um, whole numbers and integers and fractions and decimals and radicals, all the things. Um, and then there's the i unit as well, which is the imaginary unit. Um, adding and subtracting with complex numbers feels a lot like what you do when you add and subtract with polynomials. You just add the things that are real numbers together, and you add the pieces that are imaginary units together. So it's just a combining like terms kind of process. It's very straightforward. It feels just like working in an Algebra 1 class with x's for the first time or something like that. You combine the things that have x's, you combine the things that don't have x's, and then you've got um, the piece that's the, the resultant at the end, right? The answer at the end. So we're going to do a couple of examples. Is everybody good for me to switch the slide? There's a lot of definitions on one slide today, but OK. All right, so here's an example we're going to do adding and subtracting of the numbers. And um, all we're going to do is we're going to remove parentheses. If we have a negative, we distribute them through. We don't have that here. You don't really have to rewrite this. I'm going to just to remind you that if you had a negative um, and you wanted to distribute it through, um, at that point would be a good place to do that. And then we're going to combine the numbers that are real numbers together and the numbers that are imaginary numbers together. So the real number parts are the parts that don't have eyes. So you have negative 2 and positive 4, which gives you 2. And then the imaginary parts are the parts that do have the i's. So we have 6i and negative i, which gives me 5i. Okay, Just like with x's, right? Absolutely no difference at all. Combine like terms. Uh, this one's a little bit messier just because there's more pieces and because there's some negatives involved. So you do want to take a moment to distribute those negatives and make sure you switch signs and things like that because sign errors will definitely pop up as an error in my math lab. You get points taken off, things like that. So you want to be a little bit careful. So this negative right here will get distributed through to each piece. So I end up with a positive 9 and a negative 2i. And then I'll do the same thing over here. This negative will get distributed through. I will have a positive 17 and a positive i. Okay, so take, take that 10 seconds that it does and distribute your negative. Don't try and combine them before. You're, you're going to make a mistake at some point. I would as well. Okay, so just take the 10 seconds to do it. All right, we're going to combine the pieces now. So we're going to find all the real number pieces. I think I got them all. I have 7, I have 9, and 17. If we add those together, what do we get? 33. It is 33. And then we're going to do the imaginary components. So I have the negative 2i and the positive i, which gives me negative i. And we're done. Um, the directions will typically tell you to write them in standard form. Standard form is that a plus bi form. So anytime it refers to standard form, that's what it's referring to. You have the real number at the beginning part, and you have the imaginary part at the end. Okay? So it's not that writing in the opposite direction is, is a wrong statement. It's just not what we would call standard form. Okay? All right. Multiplying does have a caveat that addition and subtraction didn't encounter. So with multiplying, you multiply like you would with polynomials as well. So you maybe distribute or you maybe FOIL things out. It looks a lot like what you do in the later parts of Algebra 1, maybe the beginning parts and throughout Algebra 2. But at the very end, you have to make amends for the fact that if you have an i squared, you have to replace the i squared with what it's equal to, which is negative 1. So we do have to pay attention that we don't stop at the same place we would normally would have with an algebra um, simplification, where we've got some x squareds in them. We don't have i squared when we're done. So when we're done, we're always again going to have a real number part, an imaginary number part. There's only going to be two terms when we're done. Okay. Um, it's also worth noting that there are opportunities where you would or could get bigger powers of i, like i cubed, 
or i to the fourth. I've looked and I don't see any place inside of the book problems where it gives examples like that in this particular textbook. Okay? If you encounter that inside of your, um, what, inside of your My Math Lab, let me just make mention real quick of how you deal with it. Okay? So let's say you did have an i cubed involved. Powers of exponents tell you that you could separate this into i and i squared, right? Well, the i squared is negative 1, and the i is i, so this ends up giving you negative i. And you can break them down in that fashion if need be. But again, I don't see any places where that's showing up in any of the resources that I've looked at. That doesn't mean that WebAssign, I'm still using the right, wrong, um, platform, I'm sorry. That doesn't mean that my math lab might not show something up in there because it is kind of a randomization and I can't see every single problem it might give you. I just see sort of the types of problems. So if something shows up, it looks like this. Okay. Does that make sense? If it were to show up with an i to the fourth, you can break it down into i squared and i squared. Each of those are negative one. And what happens when you multiply negative one, negative one? You get one. Okay, so you can break them down always in this way into smaller pieces that we can utilize the i squared component being equal to negative 1. All right, so let's take a look at an example. So on this one, we have a monomial, a one-term piece in the front, and we have a binomial, two terms in the middle. And we're going to do just like you would if you had these as x's. You're going to distribute this through. So basic distribution problem, okay, at the beginning. So I have negative 8i times 2i. What will that give me? 16i squared. Yep, so it'll, it'll be negative, right? Yeah, negative 16i squared. Again, just do the distribution part as you would normally, and then we'll deal with the i squared parts later, okay? How about the next one? What is negative 8i times negative 7? Okay, so it'll be positive 56, and then somebody said i, good. Okay, so everybody good with this so far? Okay, so in an algebra problem, like just a standard, you know, algebra one kind of problem, you'd stop here and you would be done, right? You would. There, there's nothing else that you can do or need to do to simplify this. However, i squared has a value of negative one. So in the location where there's an i squared, we're going to change that i squared to negative one. Notice the i still stays i. That doesn't change. All right, so when I have the negative 16 and I have the times 1, I end up getting a positive 16. The 56i stays the same. And we make sure that at the end it's written in a plus bi form, which it is, and we would be done. So I don't know what my math lab will do if you reverse the order. It might tell you you're wrong. So do be careful that you get them into the right order, that it's the a part at the beginning, the bi part at the end. All right? Good so far. All right, what kind of a distribution problem is this one? Yeah, so it's foiling um, or it's expanding. Um, we're going to distribute this across two pieces, right? It's a binomial times a binomial. So if we think about this as foiling, and I'm going to draw my arrows because we haven't really done a lot of that together in this class. So this is my first term times the first term and my first term times the um, second term. And then I'm going to have, and I'll write them at the bottom, this piece right here multiplied out. Okay, it doesn't have to be in this order. Do whatever order you like, but you need all four components. So if I take eight times negative three, what am I gonna get? Negative 24. And if I take eight times nine i, what am I going to get? That is 72 i. So far so good. So those are the yellow pieces on top. All right, the orange pieces on bottom. I have negative four i times negative three. Yeah, it's a positive 12i. Yeah, and then the last one is a negative 36i squared. Okay, so far so good. Okay, still thinking in terms of traditional algebra with x's, what's the one other thing that I would need to do for this particular problem? Yeah, these two on the bottom <coughs> in the middle, they combine, right? They're like terms. So I have negative 24. What happens when I have positive 72i plus 12i? I have positive 84i. Okay, everybody good so far? Again, if these were x's, we would stop here, but it's not. They're i's, and I have an i squared. And what does i squared equal? Negative 1. So we're going to take the step 
And you don't have to show all the pieces of all the things. So if you feel comfortable just changing this to positive 36 right now, by all means, feel free to do so. I'm going to write mine out just in case anyone wants to see it. But at this point, I do have here at the end a positive 36. So I have negative 24 plus 84i plus 36. That's still three terms. And the reason it's three terms is because two of them still combine, right? Now I have my negative 24 at the beginning, my positive 36 at the end. And what will these two combine to? 12. And I'm writing it with the 12 at the beginning, because that's the real component. And I have the 84 at the end, the imaginary component, 84i, I should say. OK, how are we doing? So far, so good. All right, so we've encountered addition and subtraction, which is the same sort of process, right? Multiplication, which has this negative 1 component when i is squared is happening, right? This is difference. The last one is division, right? So we're going to deal with division. Division needs an additional um, term defined, and that term is a conjugate. So the conjugate of a complex number that is a plus bi is a minus bi. So it's exactly the same thing. Change the sign in the middle. That's all you got to change, and you have the conjugate. Conjugates are used in order to rationalize denominators when you have imaginary components in the denominator. Now you've rationalized denominators before you ever encountered imaginary units, but you were doing it with radicals, right? So, and we've done that in this class even, right? When you had a square root of 2 in the denominator, we multiply the top and the bottom by square root of 2. That's the ones that we've seen the majority of. But sometimes when you're dealing with square roots, you have denominators that have a square root and a real number piece, so not, not real number, excuse me, a non-irrational piece. They've got a rational piece and an irrational piece. And they use conjugates as well. We just haven't done that very much here, okay? So a conjugate is the same thing in both situations. It's the same pieces at the beginning and at the end with opposite signs. And the reason this works is because of the following. So I'm going to jot, to jot down what happens when we multiply these two things together. All right, so when we multiply a plus bi and a minus bi, we're going to do this. Okay, so when we multiply a plus bi and a minus bi, we're going to do the same thing we were doing on the previous multiplication problems. We're going to multiply the first term times everything, and we're going to multiply our second term times everything. So at the beginning, I have a times a, which gives me a squared. Then I have a times negative bi, which gives me ABI, and it's negative, right? Okay, the orange terms now on the bottom. So now I have BI times A. So if I put them in alphabetical order, right, this would be positive ABI. And then when I do the last terms, I get negative, because one's positive, one's negative, B squared, I squared. So far, so good. Okay, so Isaiah, what did you say already happened when you saw this? Two middle ones. Yeah, the two middle ones are the same, right? Um, this happens every time with conjugates. And this actually happens in an algebra situation as well. You saw it happen with something called difference of squares. Difference of squares is what this is. This is, this is what it's utilizing. So these two pieces add to 0. So that leaves me with a squared minus b squared i squared. But what's i squared? It's negative 1. So this is a squared minus b squared times negative 1, or a squared plus b squared. And what do you know is conspicuously missing from this term? I's. And that's the point. There's no i's left. And the same thing happens when we do this with radicals, right, when square roots. The goal is to get the square root out of the denominator. But when we're working with complex numbers, the goal is to get the i's out of the denominator. And this process works for both conjugates. So anytime you see something with division, what it's really asking you is to rationalize the denominator, OK? So let's take an example. We have 3 over 4 plus i. And it wants us, it says divide, right? Like the directions say divide. But what divide means, write yourself a note, that what this means is to rationalize the denominator. That's what this means in this context. So when I look at 3 over 4 plus i, I have an i in the denominator, and I don't want it there. 
So I'm going to multiply by the conjugate of my current denominator. What is the conjugate of this denominator? 4 minus i. Now, that's great, but you know from fractions, working with them all the way back to you know, the end of elementary, beginning of middle school, somewhere along the way, that you can't just go multiplying part of a fraction and call that the same thing that you started with. When you multiply fractions denominators, in this case, by a value, you have to do the same thing to their numerator. So I've got to do 4 minus i on the top and on the bottom. I will still have i's on top almost all the time when this happens. But I'll be eliminating the i from the bottom. Make sense? So one location I eliminate the i from, sometimes it puts an i in a place that it wasn't there before. But that's the goal, is to get the i's out of the denominator. So in the denominator, as I do this, again, the whole point is the inside and the outside terms, they cancel. Right? One of them is negative 4i, the other is positive 4i. They're going to go away. The only parts that I'm going to have, actually, are the first pieces and the last pieces. So the first pieces multiplied are going to give me 16. The last pieces multiplied are going to give me minus i squared. So when we FOIL, with conjugates, we really only get the first terms and the last terms. Now, if you want to write them all out every time just to make sure that you don't make a mistake, there's nothing wrong with that. But they should cancel out in the middle if you're doing it properly and still end up with just the first term squared and then the last term squared with subtraction between. Now, the numerator is not going to do that, right? There's no reason for it to. We're going to actually have to multiply the numerator out as per normal. So I have 3 times 4 gives me 12, and then 3 times negative i gives me negative 3i. Okay, and we're not done. There's still an i on the bottom, so we do have to make um, you know, an adjustment for that. The i is really i squared on the bottom, and what is i squared? Negative 1. So this becomes, instead of 16 minus i squared, it becomes 16 minus negative 1 which is the same as what? Yeah, 16 plus 1 or 17. So one way of writing this, and I'm okay with you doing, if you do this in your written work for me, is to write it like this. But I want you to recognize this is not in standard form. Standard form looks like a plus bi. And right now, the a and the b are sort of joined together with a common denominator. Do y'all see that okay? So the way that we deal with that is we just separate them into two separate fractions with their own denominator of 17 each. And I expect that my math lab is going to ask that you do that. I don't know for a fact, but I expect it will. And if we do that, this ends up being written as 12 over 17 and then minus 3 over 17 with the i after it. So this is what we're going to consider our standard form. Um, when it asks you for that in that form, that's what it's looking for. But again, if you were to have stopped here for anything that's in written form, I'm not going to concern myself with, with the change. OK? All right, so far so good? OK, we have a, another one like this. So we're doing another one where it's divide. Okay, so again, meaning rationalize the denominator. So our denominator this time is 2 plus 3i. So what will I need to do to rationalize this denominator? Conjugate, multiply by 2 minus 3i. Good deal. So 2 minus 3i. And if I do it to the denominator, you got to do it to the numerator as well. Now, this is a little bit more work than the last problem. What about this problem makes it more work? There's already an imaginary unit on the top. And not just that, but there's something else on the top, too. Yeah, there's two pieces, right? I have subtraction of two pieces in the top. So I'm going to have to work a little bit more on the numerator than I did last time. Now, the denominator is not much different. Again, the inner and the outer terms are going to cancel. So this is going to give me positive 6i, and this one's going to give me negative 6i, right? So I only need to multiply the first terms. So 2 and 2, so I get 4. And then the last terms, which is 3i and negative 3i, which gives me negative 9i squared. Okay, that's my denominator. Now, I don't get those freebies on top. 
things don't cancel out nicely. I really have to distribute and multiply them all out and proper, you know, properly. So let me put some parentheses here. If I multiply those first terms together, I have three times two, which is six. And then I have three times negative three i, which is negative nine i. Yep, and on the bottom, I have negative four i times two, which is negative eight i. And I have the negative four i times negative three i, which is positive 12 i squared. Okay, everybody good so far? All right, I have a couple things I can combine. The top part, right? I have a negative 9i and a negative 8i. Those I can combine. So let me do that one next. If you don't want to do that step next, it's not a big deal. They're going to both get done. Uh, this gives me a negative 17i on top. What would I do in addition to that to simplify this and clean it up? Yeah, the i squared is equal negative 1. So in each location where I have an i squared, I'm going to end up having a negative 1. And it'll change my signs, right? So this bottom will end up being a positive. This piece on top will be a negative. So I'm going to have 6 at the beginning and negative 12 at the end, which is going to give me negative 6 and minus my 17i. And on the bottom, I have a 4 and a 9 for my 13. OK, what do we think? It's okay? Okay, now, again, I'm fine if you stop here and written work. That's great. If it's asking you to split it or if my math lab sort of bulks at this, it's wanting you to split it up. So you're going to do negative 16 over 13 and minus 17 over 13, and then there's an I on the end. Um, it is worth noting here that if any, any of these have the ability to reduce, you should reduce them, right? Like if this denominator had been a 12, then the 6 over 12 would reduce. And we would reduce that piece when we simplified it, okay? Um, if you had both of these, like let's say that this had been a 6. I keep I'm making a mess of this, but let's say this had been a negative 6 and minus 18i and then over 12. If it looked like this, and we could actually reduce the 6 with the 12 and the 18, and they did all reduce by 6, then we would do that too. So any reducing that we can do, we will reduce. We just didn't have one that did, okay? All right. One last piece we're going to take a look at today is called the principal square root of a negative number. So if we have any positive real number b, then the principal square root of the number negative b is defined as follows. So the square root of negative b is i times the square root of b. And that's actually using a square root property that is discussed in an algebra course that you've seen before as well that says, hey, I can rewrite this as negative 1 times b, right? I mean, that's what negative b means, is negative 1 times b. And I can separate the square root to be over each piece. This works because they're multiplied. If they were added and subtracted, you can't do this. But because they're multiplied, you can. And the square root of negative 1 is i. We talked about that at the beginning, right? i square root b. Now, technically, if we were writing this in standard form, the i should come after the square root of b. Agreed? Now, I want you to be careful about this. Again, my math lab might require it. I don't know. I think it's a terrible idea to put the i afterward, and here's why. Some of you do not write very neatly. True? It's true. Some of you don't. And undoubtedly, some of you are going to make it look like it's doing this when that's not what you meant. Right? So there's no chance of it doing this if I leave the I in front. <laughs> so my suggestion is to do your best to leave the I in front, no problem. But if my math lab fusses at you, recognize that might be why it's fussing. Are you with me? OK, let's do, um, I think we have time for two examples, and then we'll pause for today. All right, square root of negative 64. Well, the negative means I'm going to do what? You're going to separate it, right? So we'll separate it out for this one. We'll do it differently for the next one. This is a negative 1, and then this is a 64. What's the square root of negative 1? I. What's the square root of 64? 8. 
<clears throat> now we're not going to write I8. That's weird. We're going to write that as 8I. There's no radicals involved. There's no reason not to. This is 8I. Now, some of you looked at this and you said, I could go straight from here and write down 8I. Excellent. You're welcome to do so. Okay? So if you recognize that and that's an okay thing for you to do, then you're welcome to do that. There's really not a need, need to show the work for this, unless you need it, and then you should. Now, this one's a little different. What, what makes this problem different than the last one? It's not a perfect square. It is not a perfect square, right? 64 is a perfect square. Okay, 200 is not. So you probably do need to pause for a moment and take a, take a second to do this, and there's several ways to do this. One of the ways, and this is the way I'm going to suggest um, to do this, is to say what is a perfect square that would divide 200 very nicely? And you probably know 100 is, right? 100 divides 200 very nicely. So I can rewrite this. I'll have my negative one out here. And then I'm going to write this as 100 and 2. That's what 200 would be. The square root of 100 right here, and you could even write it as three separate pieces if you want to. Do it like that. That's fine, too. The square root of 100 is what? Ten. It's 10. What is the negative 1 square root at the beginning? That's an i. And square root of 2 does not have another form that's simpler. So these are the pieces that you have. The way you will typically see this written is like this. All right? We put the constant at the beginning, we put the i after the constant, and then we put any radicals following. But again, I don't know, but my math lab might require that you do this. Just be paying attention to what it's telling you. If it's giving you an error and you know that you did it right, this might be the problem. Okay? We'll pick up on example nine next time.